what what techniques did you take from that film about what's going that you could use in your own labor from that father and and what he was able to do to help her? What did he do that helped her so much in that birth film? Massage. Lots of massage, lots of touching, following her around, really, from police. Very encouraging. Very encouraging. And, uh, Very positive words. And he, I liked when he said he didn't show, when he was getting rattled, he didn't want it to show that it was, you know, he wanted to stay calm for her. What did he mean when he didn't bond with the baby right away? What do you think he meant by that? Does that seem strange? Yeah, a different connection. Sometimes you see a different connection, like the mom just gave birth to the baby, and it's like, whoa, you know, like, and then the dad is going like, is that, what? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a connection, but sometimes it's a different connection because it didn't just, you know, it's an amazing feeling, like this is my baby, but I'm bonding, and yet I'm continuing to bond. You know, bonding is not just one minute in time, like that second you're bonded. So I think what he was talking about is, it grew so much, the bond. You could tell he loved that baby right in that film and how connected he was, but it, he was talking about, how much he really bonded, how it, it's not just one time in the hospital, the first hour after birth, but it, it grows as you know your child and you get to interact with your child more and more. So um, I think that's true that I want to mention that because sometimes people think it, all that bonding comes in one hour and that if you're not like, pfft, like suddenly you feel that total 100% bonded, you're not going to bond. It, it's not just a one experience moment. It continues and it grows. So as we get to the end, we're going to be focused on cesarean birth and then we're going to get on the floor and then we're going to have our babies. So we're getting, we're moving along through our day. We're right now getting to cesarean birth and some people feel very different about cesarean birth. Some people would prefer to have a cesarean birth. Um, any of you would rather have a cesarean birth than a vaginal delivery? Do you know some uh, parts of the world have cesarean rates over 50%? Pretty amazing. Um, even though we, are, we have a level three nursery and we deal with babies that are, need the most support, we have a very low cesarean rate here. It's under 20% often. That's very good because you have any mom that has uh, her first cesarean often has a second cesarean, so that raises your cesarean rates. We do also have here a VBAC class, a vaginal birth after cesarean class, and we really do encourage moms that are, have had a first cesarean, uh, if they'd like to have a VBAC, we really give them that support and encouragement to have VBAC delivery. So our VBAC delivery rates are very high at this hospital as well. So this is your first baby. Um, what would be the number one reason that you would have a cesarean? The baby's in distress. That would be number three. That would be one of the top reasons. Too big? Too big to it would be, goes under the, what is too big? Failure to progress. Right. Failure to progress and cephalopelvic disproportion, which is kind of what you said, too big. All follow under this category of failure to progress. And in childbirth classes, you learn what you can do to not have failure to progress. Stay home during early labor. Move, change positions. Um, basically, do not be induced unless medically necessary because induction has a higher rate of cesarean section. Those are some of the things you learn in childbirth classes. Everything we've learned for the fathers taking and coaches to take an active role in labor and delivery helps mom feel comfortable and safe in her birth environment and that helps labor progress. So. You know, childbirth classes, we really try to reduce uh, failure to progress. But some of the other reasons for a cesarean, really childbirth classes don't have, you know, really um, learning your breathing doesn't reduce the chance of fetal distress. Fetal distress is often when there is um, a cord like wrapped around the neck or it's a short cord. 
um, for some reason that baby as you go through labor is not getting the oxygen supply it needs to get. And fetal, fetal distress would be the second most common one. And then we've got fetal malpresentation or position. So what if the baby is breech or what if the baby is transverse? My little baby over here. We talked about posterior labor sometimes also if the baby does not turn to anterior may be a reason for a cesarean as well. But then we have babies that decide to be in a, a breech position. Now breech positions are about 3%. Now an option of a breech baby is in some breech positions at, they can actually manually turn the baby to a head down position. Now. If you had a breech, a baby was in a breech position, uh, 37 weeks, and the baby had not turned on his own, you may be a candidate for that external version. That would be something to ask your physician about. There's many things that have to occur. There has to be enough amniotic fluid, and the baby can't have already lightened into the pelvis. But that's something that you could discuss with your physician. If the baby is breech when you go into labor, um, the baby is not going to be delivered uh, vaginally because you have the largest diameter coming last and that can uh, be a risk factor for the baby not getting enough oxygen. So breech deliveries are usually scheduled. Cesarean sections. Prolapse cord is when the cord gets in front of the baby's head and the baby comes down on top of the cord. That reduces the oxygen that the baby's getting across the placenta. So prolapse cord can be a stat C-section, an emergency cesarean. Also, you can have placenta previa. Now placenta previa, you had already been told about, so you don't really have to worry about that. It would be when the placenta is over the cervix, so the baby has, can't exit. And another reason would be abruption placenta. If the placenta separated from the uterine wall prematurely, the baby would lose its oxygen and that would cause an, a stat C-section. That would be immediate cesarean. Now, on abruption, the symptoms of that or the signs with that would be hemorrhaging, extreme pain. And with a prolapse cord or with placenta abruption, if that happened at home, that's a 911 emergency call. Um, to be transported to the hospital, and that would be an emergency cesarean, which would be with a general anesthesia. General anesthesia is faster than giving the mom an ep uh, epidural anesthesia, and so that's the way you would go with an emergency situation. With emergency situation, the coach could not come in the operating room. With a scheduled cesarean or a cesarean for fetal distress during labor, they have time to give an epidural. The coach will be able to come under normal circumstances into the operating room. They'd have to get in scrubs. The scrubs are paper scrubs. You put them over your clothes. So, you know, I just once had a father take off his clothes and put on the paper scrubs, and it was not a pretty sight. <laughs> but, but it was, so basically the, you can see through the paper scrubs. So you keep your clothes on and put the, the um, you know, the paper scrubs on top of it. Then you sit next to mom. Now in this picture, you can see um, in the operating room, mom is on the operating table. And the operating table is going to feel narrow compared to the labor and delivery uh, t uh, bed. Her arms are positioned out to the side and secured. She's also secured on the other side of the um, anesthesia screen. So her body stays more um, stable on the operating table. Her anesthesiologist would be up by her head, and that is one of your main guides during the cesarean. They can give you information during the cesarean about what's going on, and then the coach is beside her, talking to her, helping her with her breathing techniques. Elective, we already talked about. That's for moms that prefer to have a cesarean, um, and maternal disease. That would be maybe active herpes at the time of delivery. That would not be as safe to deliver a baby vaginally if the mom had an outbreak of herpes. So those would be some of the reasons for a cesarean delivery. Now we covered some of the, these are the baby in the correct head down position. 
and a face presentation. A face presentation is like one in 500. That's with the face coming first. Um, so that basically is another reason to do a cesarean section. And uh, these are unusual positions, but it's gonna be better for the baby for a cesarean than a difficult vaginal delivery. So here's our breech babies. We have footling, frank, and complete. And if a baby's transverse, that is another position that baby is not gonna fit through the pelvis with the shoulders coming first. So once the decision is made for a cesarean, and again, go through acting, what are the benefits, what are the alternatives, and what are the risks? You can ask like, do we need to do a cesarean now? Is there anything else we can try? Can we wait a little bit longer? And they'll let you know that information. Sometimes waiting a little bit longer doesn't change the outcome. The cesarean is still necessary. But then moms may feel, we tried everything. Sometimes you can't wait longer. That baby needs to be delivered soon for the safety of baby or mother. So these are questions to ask. The decision is made to have a cesarean. What happens next? You sign your consent form. They come, um, the anesthesiologist, your surgeon, which will be obstetrician, will come in and talk to you about the surgery. They will prep you for the surgery. You'll have an anti-acid to neutralize the stomach acids. You'll have your IV, if it's not already placed, an IV will be placed then, a catheter in the bladder. Um, they sometimes do a mini shave, most times they don't, but you're now in the operating room and you're on the, positioned on the operating table. You can see in that screen how the screen, she is not to touch anything on the other side of the screen because that needs to be sterile during the surgery. Once the surgery begins, the baby is born in like five minutes. That's pretty amazing. Um, and the room is crowded. There's more people in the cesarean room that's in this room today. So you, you can be our pediatricians. You're like gonna examine the baby after the baby's born. You can be the scrub net tech and the circulating nurse and you can be uh, the anesthesiologist over there, right? So it's a crowded room. Then you got the coach and you got mom and the baby is going to be born. Usually um, we tell the coach if you, you can see everything if you want or you can see nothing. It depends. What do you think you wanna see? Do you wanna see that? You wanna keep your eyes just on mom. If you wanna look over the drape, you can actually see the surgery. Now the first incision is usually the incision that's harder to see because that's the first, the skin incision, which is made right above the pubic bone. And that's about five to six inches, the skin incision. Um, then they go through layer by layer. There's very little blood at this point because you're not in any vascular organ. So you go through the skin, the fat, the fascia. You move the bladder out of the way. You separate the muscles, you don't cut them. Then you go through the peritoneum. It's a translucent membrane over the uterus. And then you make the five inch incision in the uterus. And then you sometimes moms will feel no pain during the procedure, but they may feel pressure because they're pressing on the fundus to guide the baby out that five inch incision. So let me show you how that works. Here is my, the last incision. Now the last incision you is, uh, you basically hear a lot of suctioning sounds because they're basically suctioning up all that amniotic fluid. And you also hear, uh, besides the suctioning sounds, you also hear um, and smell some cauterizing. So you might hear some as they're sealing some bleeding blood vessels. So then the baby is guided out that incision, and this is your baby, that's the amniotic sac. Voila. And so the coach can look and see what's happening. The mom can't see the delivery. So mom may feel a little bit of this tugging as they maneuver the baby through that incision. And then the umbilical cord will be clamped here as the baby eases out. Ooh. 
voila, baby is born. Now you could cry. <laughs> we had the crying baby sound right now. And then the cord will stop pulsating in a, and in about a minute they'll clamp the umbilical cord and then they'll cut it. Now this is when the coach does not cut the cord or mom does not cut the cord because it's a sterile field. So the cord is cut and then the baby goes over to the pediatrician. So I want you to examine that baby for me. <laughs> and baby, give, basically see how the baby's doing. You're gonna give the baby the first APGAR scores. Now the uterus clamps down and contracts, and then the placenta is delivered from the same incision as the baby was, voila. So then what happens? Placenta is complete. Then the uterus then needs to be repaired. So we, ba um, Sometimes the uterus is actually brought forward in the abdomen and they suture it there and then placed back in the abdomen and then each layer is repaired separately. This takes about 45 minutes, the repair work, because they have to repair each incision separately. Then the skin incision is usually closed with like staples, which are removed before you leave the hospital. Now, after the baby has been checked by the pediatricians, baby's breathing well, baby's doing really well, then the baby is given to the coach. And the coach then would hold the baby and get that close to mom as possible. Because a mom uh, hasn't got to see the baby being born, and this would be her first time to touch the baby. So she would ask for one arm free if possible to bring that baby up to her cheek and she could talk and hold her baby and see the baby. She'll need assistance holding her baby because she's in the middle of surgery. Remember the repair work takes about 45 minutes. And then the room is kind of cold like it is today so usually the baby and the coach go out of the operating room because the mother will be there for about 30 more minutes to finish the repair work. And the coach or the dad goes back to the birthing room to bond with the baby. Can you stay awake once they leave or will they like pump up your anesthesia and kind of put you under while they... Well sometimes if moms feel a little nauseous they'll give you a little medication so that you it can combat the nausea because sometimes during the repair work that makes you a little nauseous so sometimes moms kind of lose a little they give her a relaxation agent like a tranquilizer so mom can kind of relax during that period of the repair work and then mom as soon as mom is finished with the repair work she's in with her baby and ready to nurse so as soon as you get out of that operating room it'll be time to nurse in the meantime dad has taken off his shirt though and he's getting the baby ready for you so the baby will be on his chest and he'll be doing skin to skin with the baby so the fathers are very important, or the coaches are very important for doing that golden hour. Can the fathers do skin to skin even if you have a vaginal birth, like after? The oh, birth? sure, yeah. And then, and and I would really uh, suggest that during that hour, both of you hold the baby skin to skin. Yes. What may you can decide this yourself, but do you want to? Uh, you know, sometimes. Um, there's so many relatives that come in, maybe that would be better for them to wait the second hour mm -hmm. so the baby doesn't get passed around okay. um, so much. And the parents can really hold their baby that first hour. So you can kind of decide that yourself, what you want to do. So we're going to see this little opening. This will be the last film we see today because this will be the birth film of a cesarean. So you get to go in the operating room now and see what it really would be like if mom had a cesarean, how you could support her and make it a very family-centered cesarean. So after a cesarean, you're recovering from major abdominal surgery. So it's going to mean a different recovery than a mom that's had a vaginal delivery. You're going to need a lot more support in the hospital. We always encourage someone to stay with mom in the hospital, spend the night, because you're going to have the baby in your room. You're going to be doing the diaper changing, the burping, everything. But if mom's had a C-section, that first day, it's difficult getting out of bed. Um, she's going to need more help at home. So kind of plan for that. And remember that 
Things you can do in the hospital that can help you is get out of bed as soon as possible, walking. We're going to go back to our deep breathing in a minute, and deep breathing is really good for a C-section. After a C-section, you want to do the deep abdominal breathing. You also want to do ankle rotations, moving your legs, get the circulation going. Um, you're going to watch what you eat, though. You cannot eat anything but clear liquids until your GI system kind of wakes up and starts to function again. So you're going to be limited a little bit on the, you know, the menu. But the sooner you start walking, deep breathing, the soon everything comes back to normal. And if you get an opportunity to pass gas, because you're going to get a lot of abdominal gas, pass it. It doesn't matter who's in the room. Just let it go. It feels like heaven. So um, expect to need more help and expect to have someone with you in the hospital all the time. I remember my husband, my first C-section, I've had two C-sections, and my first one was baby three, and he went home to take care of the rest of the kids. And I remember, I couldn't believe I felt so helpless, like the baby's crying and I can't get the baby. So, and no one was in the room to help me. Now we do have volunteers at TMC can help if mother needs a break, but I would really encourage you to really bring your own support team in to help take care of you and the baby and give you that break that you need. So after a C-section, moms, some moms feel a little bit of mixed feelings. Um, they feel so happy that the baby is born safely and they're doing well, but they still miss the fact they didn't have the birth that they expected. So the coach can help by really talking about this with mom. Let her express those feelings. Um, and realizing it did help me when I had my first C-section, knowing if I had another child, I could have a VBAC delivery if I wanted to. And I did, but I remember um, you know, planning um, that opportunity. If I got pregnant again, I wanted to go for a vaginal delivery instead of another cesarean. So that is an option.